We'll intervene whenever we decide it's in our national security interest to intervene. And if you don't like it, lump it. The problem with America is not that we go around marauding around the world imposing ourselves. Mm. The problem with America in the last 10, 15 years since the end of the Cold War, really in the last 60 years, is that we've been too slow to get involved. I don't know how many Iraqi civilians were killed, but I can assure you that the number is the absolute uh, minimal that it's possible uh, in modern warfare. Every nation in every region now has a decision to make. Either you are with us or you are with the terrorists. You know, that land over there is yours. You'll go back to it one day because your fight will prevail and you'll have your homes and your mosques back again because your cause is right and God is on your side. Welcome to the Darkened Hour. Welcome to another episode of the Darkened Hour. I'm your host, Adam Fitzgerald. With me today is Dan Christensen. Mr. Christensen founded Florida Bulldog in 2009 using the name Broward Bulldog. He is an award-winning former investigative reporter for the Miami Herald and Daily Business Review, and one of South Florida's most experienced reporters. He holds undergraduate and graduate degrees in political science from the University of Miami, and the Florida Bulldog is the preeminent publication regarding the September 11, 2001 terrorist attacks, past and current Saudi involvement, including the Justice Against Sponsors for Terrorism Act, which amends the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act and the Anti-Terrorism and Effective Death Penalty Act in regards to civil claims against a foreign state for inquiries, death, or damages from an act of international terrorism. Dan, thank you very much for coming on. Hey, thanks for having me, Adam. Oh, by the way, what gave you the idea to start the Florida Bulldog in the first place? And who is Anthony Summers? Uh, well, I started uh, Florida Bulldog after I got laid off as an investigative reporter for the Miami Herald back in 2009. I think I was in the third round of layoffs after the newspaper industry sort of hit the iceberg. And I hadn't been there very long. I'd come over from a, another paper. And um, I realized that I did not want to... Uh, sell floor shimes or do uh, flip hamburgers or things like that. And so I contacted an attorney in town, a guy named Tom Julin, and uh, who I had met uh, on occasion uh, and asked him uh, about the possibility of setting up a not-for-profit news site. These sites were beginning to emerge around the country and uh, have continued to do so. And we are part of a group called the uh, uh, INN or the Institute for Nonprofit News. Um, why was the September 11, 2001 terrorist attack such an important issue with Florida Bulldog? Well, it was an important issue because I got drafted into this uh, sort of by uh, Anthony Summers. Uh, he and his wife, Robin Swan, had written a book called The 11th Day back in 2011. It had not come out yet. But I've known Tony. He lives in Ireland. I've known Tony for a long time. And uh, he contacted me, said that uh, they had developed this lead. There wasn't time enough to get it in the book. Would I be interested in helping him uh, report it out? And I said, yes, absolutely. And that's how I got involved in all this. Because when uh, September 11th happened, I was working for a paper down here called the Daily Business Review, which is part of the American Lawyer Network. I covered federal courts. And, uh, uh, but we did not cover, uh, you know, the 9-11 attacks. Well, let's just start off with a recent bombshell you just reported on Monday regarding former U.S. Saudi ambassador, Prince Bandar bin Sultan, who refused to acknowledge a court-ordered deposition by U.S. Magistrate Sarah Newburn. Could you tell us more about this? Sure. Uh, he, um, you know, I mean, Prince Bandar was the... Uh, uh, ambassador to the United States between, I believe, either 82 or 83 and uh, 2005, I think it was. And uh, so he was the ambassador at the time of the terrorist attacks. And he was pretty vocal at the time going on, you know, Larry King Live and uh, Face the Nation, other, other uh, uh, national television shows uh, in defense of Saudi Arabia. And uh, so I found it interesting that uh, he, and, and perhaps telling, that he refused to testify 
when uh, asked to do so by the uh, lawyers who represent the victims and this, you know, the family members and survivors of 9-11 who were suing Saudi Arabia. Is it, do you, is it a reason for him not to uh, acknowledge the deposition because uh, he may know more about Saudi financing than he would then have to implicate himself, do you think? Well, uh, you know, I mean, who knows what he was going to say. We do know uh, both uh, Anthony Summers and Robin Swan wrote a story for the Bulldog a couple of years ago uh, after they managed to get a copy of the uh, uh, statement uh, uh, that he made to the 9-11 Commission, which had been kept secret for quite a long time. And uh, there wasn't a transcript of it, but there was a memo about it. And uh, it showed that he wasn't asked any serious questions uh, about you know, his knowledge of 9-11 or the events of 9-11. And you know the lawyers, you know, have a number of questions that they'd like to ask him, because he's, um, you know, since all that time, you know, nearly 20 years ago, we've learned some very interesting things about him. Um, one of the most interesting uh, is that he, uh, or not that he, but that uh, his phone number, uh, private unlisted phone number, for his. Uh, the company that manages his ranch out in Colorado, it's a 90 acre estate out there, uh, was in the, uh, uh, the personal phone book of a guy named Abu Zubeda, who was uh, one of the guys who was picked up on the battlefield in, in uh, Pakistan. And, uh, you know, later, frankly, tortured by the United States and has been held at the uh, Guantanamo base ever since. What was his phone number doing in that guy's uh, phone book? We don't know. We'd like to, you know, the lawyers would like to ask him. I'd like to ask him. Uh, and there's a, other questions. Money from he and his wife, Princess Haifa, were sent to a guy who had contact with the hijackers uh, and is suspected of being a Saudi agent prior, obviously prior to 9-11 in Southern California. There's questions, why did that money go? You know, supposedly the money went to pay for this man's uh, wife's medical condition. But uh, I've been told that uh, that was a bogus story. Uh, the question becomes, why did you send that money to, uh, to them? And then there's a whole host of additional questions about Prince Bandar that frankly, I think he's obliged to answer. In, in 2016, during a freedom of information litigation, you were privy to an active FBI investigation called Operation Encore, which was involving Muasset al Jara, Fahad al Tumeri, and Omar al Bayoumi, who had all came into contact with two individuals who would later be suspected of hijacking American Airlines Flight 77, Khalid al Midar, and Nawaf al Hazmi. What did you uncover here? Well, uh, it, we had sued the FBI. We sued the FBI twice. Uh, the first time was for information about things that happened here in Florida uh, that I'm sure that we'll be discussing in a few minutes. But the second lawsuit was for the files of what was called the 9-11 Review Commission, which was a group that was put together in, I believe it was in 2014, they issued their report in 2015, uh, they were a, sort of a creature of the FBI. Uh, they were formed by it. Their members included Ed Meese, the uh, former attorney general under President Reagan. Uh, they were paid by the FBI. They were spoon-fed information by the FBI. And they issued their report in 2015. And the, the, uh, their ostensible purpose was to examine uh, whether or not certain recommendations that had been made by the uh, original 9-11 review, 9-11 uh, commission had been instituted by the FBI. So they looked at that, but they also looked at new information that had come out since the 9-11 uh, uh, commission uh, closed down back in 2004. One of the things they looked at was the stuff that we reported on here in Florida about uh, the Saudis living over in the Sarasota area who had contact with the hijackers. And they sought to debunk that 
uh, and uh, in the course of that uh, uh, report, they mention a an uh, October two thousand and twelve FBI summary report, and so I, uh, you know, I requested a copy of it along with all this other information from the uh, uh, from the nine eleven review commission. And they released it after we sued them. They didn't release it until months after we sued them, but they released a very heavily censored copy of this, which uh, came to be the first public acknowledgement of what uh, was called Operation Encore, which was essentially an FBI investigation into Saudi complicity in 9-11. And it was a, uh, a very intriguing thing, apparently, uh, from what we can tell and what's been reported uh, by uh, uh, ProPublica on this and the New York Times, uh, it, um, it, it, I don't know, it split the FBI, let's put it that way. And uh, it, it created, uh, it, it was an investigation that went on between approximately 2007 and 2016. Uh, and they were looking to charge people with being uh, sort of uh, uh, providing material support, I believe is the phrase that's used right. to some of the hijackers. That never happened. But in this October 2012 thing, which is somewhat in the middle of this, it disclosed this information uh, that they were looking at. And it showed that there were, it, it named, a, it, the names get very confusing here because we're talking about names that Western minds aren't familiar with. These are Arab names. And uh, so they can be uh, confusing to a lot of people. But there were a couple of people that were named in that report whose names had come out previously. A guy named uh, uh, Fahad al-Fameri and Omar al-Bayoumi who were living in Southern California at the time uh, Thumeri was a, a diplomat and a member of the uh, uh, Los Angeles uh, King Fahd Mosque, and they had contacts, connections with the hijackers. Bayoumi uh, befriended them, did a number of different things to help them after they landed in, in the United States in January of 2000. And uh, they became the focus of the litigation that's happening up in New York. Uh, the massive civil suit up there against Saudi Arabia that's brought by the, you know, by the victims of 9-11. And the reason that that's the focus is the federal judge in the case limited discovery to what happened in Southern California and specifically to whether or not uh, there were connections between the Saudi government uh, and uh, uh, Thumeri and Bayoumi. So that became a very important part of this. And that was sort of featured in this 2012 in, uh, FBI in, intelligence report. So after we got a copy of it, uh, we were contacted by the attorneys for the families up there and we provided them with a copy of that. And it's since become a centerpiece of the investigation in New York. Uh, they have attempted to try and get uh, a full version of it released. Uh, they've managed to get little bits and pieces of it, uh, and, uh, but not much more than we got. And uh, it, it became a, even a matter of greater controversy when uh, Attorney General Bill Barr, who was uh, hmm. President Trump's uh, Attorney General, uh, personally invoked the state secrets privilege to keep that document and related documents secret. Um, and all the reasons that were given were given um, um, only to the judge and weren't made public. So we only know in a general sense what they were arguing, but essentially it boils down to national security, which is a, uh, an argument that we've heard before and often has not held water when it's, when it's been proven. So when the doc, when, I should say, when the documents in question later became public, we found out that national security really wasn't involved. Correct. Right. 
to go back on that point about Sarasota, because I think this is an important area. On September 5th of 2012, you filed a Freedom of Information Act lawsuit in the federal court in Fort Lauderdale against the Department of Justice, um, in which a 25-page FOIA complaint seeking records of an FBI investigation involving a Saudi family who were former residents of Sarasota who may have provided aid or assistance to the 9-11 hijackers. The person of interest was Abdulaziz al Hidji who lived at 4224 Escondido Circle, um, but the home was owned by Isam Ghazawi. Can you give us a backdrop on this and what happened with the FOIA request? Sure, this was the, uh, the, uh, you know, the original point of entry for uh, myself uh, on this whole thing, because this was the lead that Tony Summers had developed. He had spoken with a, uh, uh, a senior counterterrorism agent who had been involved in this directly. And uh, another gentleman who was the head of security and also a resident at a place called Prestancia, a very large uh, upper class uh, development over in the Sarasota area. And um, what, and, and so this was our first story in October of 2011, uh, well, it's 10 years ago now. And uh, we reported then that. Uh, this family, the al Hiji family, uh, two weeks before the uh, September 11th attacks, they sort of abruptly left their home in the Prestancia development. Uh, they left behind cars, new cars. They left behind uh, clothing. They left behind uh, stuff in the refrigerator. They left behind their fur. They left behind everything, including an open safe in the master bedroom. And um, they flew to, we later found they flew to Washington, uh, met up with uh, Mr. Ghazawi up there, the al did, and uh, then they all flew back to Saudi Arabia. And they didn't come back for at least a couple of years after that to reclaim the, uh, reclaim the uh, and sell the property. It was, it was suspected that uh... Muhammad Atta and Marwan al Shahi, members of the Hamburg cell, had visited this residence, which is the reason why there was uh, an interest into the Hiji family. Um, yes, and we knew that because the, uh, the um, counterterrorism uh, uh, agent and uh, the, the uh, security director uh, at the uh, development there, uh, his name is Larry Berberick. They um, told us, uh, both Tony and myself, about how um, the FBI had collected um, records from the, it's a gated community, and from the, from the gates, uh, when, when cars would come in, uh, they'd photograph license plates, they would also have, have the drivers sign in, say they were going, where they were going. And those uh, sign-in books and also the photographs of the license plates were turned over to the FBI, according to both these gentlemen. And, uh, you know, what happened to all that? Uh, we don't know. The FBI later said that they didn't obtain this information. And um, that's why they couldn't turn it over to us because they had never obtained it. Um, which sort of seems to fail FBI 101, since that would be the one thing that you could do to determine who went in and out of that development. Um, but uh, the bottom line is that we know from these very reliable good sources that that was the case. And we also know uh, because later on, when after we filed that lawsuit, we got stonewalled initially for a full year, they wouldn't respond to our uh, simple request for information under the Freedom of Information Act. So we sued. And we, uh, about six months later, um, I went out to the uh, mailbox one day and there was a package from the FBI and in it were a number of documents, the most significant of which, again, was highly uh, censored here, um, that stated that the uh, people that we were looking at had, quote, many connections, unquote, uh, to people involved in 9-11. And uh, that, by the way, was diametrically opposed to what the FBI had said publicly about this, mm. because when uh, Tony and I broke the first story, which we ran on our 
on the Florida Bulldog website uh, the same day uh, the Herald, Miami Herald uh, purchased the story from us and ran it front page of the Miami Herald. Uh, and um, they uh, uh, came out and said a day later, uh, by the way, in advance of the story, we contacted the Department of Justice. They said they wouldn't have any comment. And then the FBI, the day after the story comes out, uh, says that uh, uh, contacts a reporter at the Miami Herald, not me, and uh, for some strange reason, and tells them that, uh, that while indeed they did do this investigation uh, uh, over in Sarasota, that they found no connections between the people involved and 9-11. And, you know, that was later put to, you know, the lie was put to that by this document that was released that showed that, in fact, there were many connections. Now, what those connections were, they blanked out a lot of stuff, and um, they have been unwilling to release any other information, even though they have as many as 80,000 other pages about all this in their records. And we know that because that's the number of documents that were turned over relating to 9-11 from the Tampa field office turned over to the judge in our case to look at uh, for his eyes only and uh, never released to us because they've all been uh, classified, which seems to be a rather sweeping use of the secrecy uh, stamp. Just to follow up on that, you, re you also report on two individuals. Um, we, we some Taysir Hamoud and Adnan Gushir El Shukna Juna, who is the alleged chief of global operations for Al Qaeda um, and it was suspected to have visited the home of Al Hij prior to 9-11. Now, the 9-11 Commission would later write in its final report that Shukna Judah's father is a well-known imam in South Florida and who once testified on the behalf of Sheikh Omar Abdel Rahman, an Egyptian cleric, uh, during his trial for the conspiracy in the Landmarks plot. Can you give us some background on Shukna Judah? Yeah, uh, Shukna Juma lived down here. Uh, he attended... Um... Broward College, Broward being the, the county that uh, Fort Lauderdale is in, uh, and um, he, he came up in in our reporting, uh, both in the initial story when it was the counterterrorism agent said that they had picked up information that he had either visited the house or been in telephone contact, I believe, with people at the house, and um, but also uh, I spoke with a guy who's uh, was and I believe still is in prison on a federal weapons charge. He had connections to Hezbollah, uh, according to the government. And uh, he said he knew this al Hiji fella and said that al Hiji once tried to recruit him to fight in uh, Afghanistan mm -hmm. and that he also introduced him uh, to Shukrajuma at a soccer game in Sarasota back prior to 9-11. Um, if that's the case, that just is another large brick in the wall here that uh, uh, seems to demonstrate that uh, Mr. al Hiji had some very interesting connections in the terrorist world. Which I, which I believe, I think al Hiji was actually killed in... Uh... No, al Hiji is alive and well. Oh, no, uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, Shukna Jura is actually... Yeah, Shukra Juma was killed in... Uh, in uh, Pakistan by the Pakistani military oh, three or four years ago. Well, and, and by the way, you were- uh, And they have, by the way, after, shortly after 9-11, um, the US government put a, I believe it was either a million or $5 million bounty on Shukra Juma's head. Oh, I, did, I didn't know that. Yeah. Um, and, and what happened to Al Hiji, by the way? Al Hiji, uh, you know, they left the country, um, and he, for a time, uh, moved to London. I understand he's back in Saudi Arabia now, but he was in London. And um, we actually caught up with him there. Oh. Um, yeah, Tony Summers and uh, a guy from the Daily Telegraph who he was working with, uh, tracked him down. And um, they ended up speaking with him by phone. We got a couple of pictures of him that we used in some of the stories um, that the Daily Telegraph ran and we were in. Um, in which he denied uh, having, you know, any sinister involvement, any involvement in 9-11 at all. Uh, and, uh, um, you know, I mean, that was the, that was the, the most important thing that he had to say. 
uh, was it he had no involvement in 9-11 at all? There, Florida seems to be such an epicenter for pre-9-11. Uh, and there's so much mystery surrounding Huffman Aviation, which was previously owned by Rudy Deckers when he bought the company in 1999. Now, Deckers has since been arrested for drug distribution charges, cocaine and heroin, and also suspected of exporting state-of-the-art computer memory chips out of the U.S. illegally. However, this is where both Mohammed Atta and Marwan al Shahi had conducted their flight training and got their commercial rated licenses from December of 2000. And you've reported on this um, regarding Huffman Aviation. What is your uh, story surrounding Rudy Deckers and Huffman? Well, I mean, I've spoken with Rudy Deckers before he got busted. Um, and, uh, you know, I mean, he had, he, he had talked to a number of uh, reporters and certainly federal agents long before I got to him. Uh, and um, so he didn't really have anything new to tell me about what happened there, but he acknowledged that they had been there and uh, that they had trained there. They trained at other locations too. Uh, in South Florida and uh, it, perhaps other uh, sites. I'm not all that sure. But I will say this, the one thing that the FBI did put out that's been very useful is uh, they put out a chronology uh, that you can find online yes. uh, of the uh, movements of the hijackers. I mean, you know, they went to, uh, the, uh, they went to a, uh, an ATM to get money and uh, they will say that they, on such and such a date, they went to the, you know, the, the, the XYZ bank and with, made a withdrawal or something. And um, uh, matter of fact, where I live in, uh, in Florida, in Fort Lauderdale, um, they used to drive up and down the street uh, right near where I live, uh, a place called Commercial Boulevard, and uh, they went to um, they went to a tire store. The uh, Marwan Al Shahi, the guy who flew into the South Tower, he took um, I believe he took Ada's car and he bought tires at a tire store that I frequent uh, uh, back then. I frequented back then, uh, and I had been there that summer with my son. I may have been there the same day. I don't know that he was there, but. Uh, Later on, when I found out, it certainly sent a chill up my spine. I'll know that. Yeah. Uh, and it, it seems that when they landed in Florida, um, the intelligence apparatuses were closely monitoring them, all the way even from uh, Germany, when they were uh, a part of the Al Quds Mosque in uh, Hamburg, Germany. And this is the reason why they got the nickname Hamburg Cell. In uh, 2002, the FBI drafted its report regarding the high flyers um, who were employees at Irving Moving Systems and they were suspected of being a front company for Israeli intelligence. One individual who was part of that group, Omar Mamari, was said to have lived just temporarily in Florida, uh, where two of the lead hijackers, Mohammed Atta and Mohammed Al-Shea, he had lived for a brief time, I, I believe, Hollywood, Florida. One house located on Sheridan Drive was owned by Henan Serfati, a lead agent in the Israeli art ring, um, which was uh, a, an Israeli uh, spy intelligence ring that infiltrated uh, the homes of like the DEA and the FBI. And most of these Israelis were deported back to Israel without any further investigation by the Department of Justice. Was this also a heavily protected area similar to like the Saudis? You're asking me something I do not know much about, right. so okay. it would be best for me not to say anything because I okay. I did not report on that, so I'm not I'm not familiar with it. Well, my report my reporting has focused on two areas. One is what happened here in Florida, and uh, and also what's been going on up in New York uh, City where the lawsuit is. Right. But the um, I I would like to say something about what happened here in Florida when. Um, when uh, Tony Summers and I were first working on this story, we went, uh, what happened in Sarasota, went uh, to talk to uh, uh, former Senator Bob Graham, uh, a Democrat from Florida, who had served as the uh, co-chairman of Congress's joint inquiry into 9-11. And by joint inquiry means the House and the Senate got together and looked at 9-11 for about a year uh, prior to the 9-11 commission. And we went to him to tell him about what had happened here in Sarasota and he didn't know anything about it. 
And he was pretty upset, not at us, but he was upset that the FBI had not told him about this because the FBI was supposed to inform the committee of any information that it had about 9-11 so it could be properly looked at by Congress. They didn't do that. They kept this investigation secret um, you know, for 10 years until we found out about it and reported on it. And they acknowledged that it had happened but said there was nothing to it. Um, so the question, part of the question becomes, why did they keep this secret? Why did they not tell uh, Congress about this? Why did they also not tell the 9-11 Commission? There's no mention in the 9-11 Commission documents or report about this particular incident. Um, they said they did notify the 9-11 Commission about this, but uh, nobody at the 9-11 Commission that we spoke to, uh, including uh, um, oh, the guy who was the co-chairman of it from uh, oh, Richard Shelby. No, the uh, no, oh, the, Border, uh, Border, Border Goss? Yeah, not no. It was Kane and um, oh, and Thomas Keene and Lee Hamilton. Yeah, Lee Hamilton. That's the guy. He didn't know anything about this. Uh, I tried to reach Kane. He didn't. He didn't know anything about. It, or I couldn't get to him. But uh, I did reach Lee Hamilton, and he knew nothing about this. Um, and we reached some staff people that weren't aware of this too. So the question becomes, why were they keeping this secret? And why also did they ship the agent who had worked the case, um, a guy named Gregory Sheffield, off to Hawaii, um, either while this investigation was still going on or shortly after it ended, about two years uh, after um, it began. We don't know the answers to those. I've tried to reach out to this uh, chef, agent Sheffield. He hasn't responded to my requests. And the FBI, you know, then shall we say not helpful. Sure, yeah, and you just answered my question regarding Bob Graham because I was gonna ask you about um, Bob Graham uh, regarding the Sarasota Saudis. Uh, yes, he was, he was very upset that he didn't know about this. And later on, interestingly, he took it upon himself uh, to contact the FBI to ask them about this and, you know, why he wasn't uh, informed of this. And remember, he had a uh, top secret security clearance. He was also, uh, he served, was serving on a commission involving the CIA. Um, and um, so he contacted them and they spoke with him briefly and they showed him some documents about this, including what proved to be the Many Connections memo that we obtained through FOIA later on. When he got it, when they, were when they showed it to him, um, he was under a pledge of secrecy, so he couldn't tell us what was in it. But he did tell us that it was diametrically opposed to the public statements that the FBI was making at the time, which later proved to be the case when we got our hands on the document ourselves. And, you know, none of this, None of this is adding up here, except for the, the, the only reasonable explanation here is that they were protecting Saudi Arabia because they were our putative ally in the Middle East here, an ally that uh, Senator Graham uh, would call our perfidious ally, and which I thought was a rather accurate statement. Yeah. Um, so you know, that's that's sort of the weirdness of this whole story. The FBI has not come clean about it uh, to this day. The families are still pushing through their attorneys to get this information. Um, we're hoping that the Biden administration may open things up because, uh, you know, uh, I, I also reported about a week ago uh, that the uh, the government has notified the court that Operation Encore has now been closed. Prior to that, they said they couldn't release anything about it because it was open. But now they've said it's closed and they're said that they are going to re-examine uh, what can be released and do so uh, expeditiously. But we will see. I, are, you, are you familiar with Shay Sullivan, a former reporter of the Long Boat Observer? Uh, I, I know the name, but I don't know the person. I, the reason why I'm asking is because I once emailed Shay Sullivan um, from the Long Boat Observer about an article he wrote way back in 2001, just weeks after 9-11 had happened. And he talked about 
an incident involving the Colony Beach and Tennis Resort when a van full of Arabs posing as press wanted to speak with President Bush who was staying there while on a school visit at the Emma Booker Elementary. Are you familiar with this incident? I'm familiar with the allegations. Um, I talked to some people that um, um, said they had knowledge of it at the time. It does seem like something happened uh, but I haven't been able to get anything more about it. Uh, Wait, just, uh, just to give you a heads up, because I spoke with, with Chase Sullivan. He basically said that um, he got information from um, a former fire official who was at the security gates where um, Secret Service was at. Um, and when the Arabs went to try and interview Bush, uh, they said, well, we don't have your name. Could you call Human Resources? And they drove away. Um, Sullivan went to interview the official and the guard at the gate, and he wasn't involved with interviewing Secret Service. But then when he went to report on the story, the Secret Service actually went and visited Shea Sullivan and his editor and told him not to run the story. Incidentally, sure. incidentally enough, just two days prior to September 11th, on September 9th, Ahmed Shah Massoud, the leader of the Northern Alliance, who's fighting against the Taliban, was actually killed by two Al Qaeda members posing as journalists. And there was this almost like this correlation between maybe trying to assassinate Bush while he was at the, uh, at the school. And that's the reason why um, I, I tried to contact Shea I, I contacted Shea Sullivan and talked to him about the, the issue. Um, but um, the FBI basically told him not to run the story. And I found that very to be quite peculiar. You have you have any opinions on that? Or? Yeah, that is peculiar, um, and they obviously they didn't succeed, which is good. Right. Um, and uh, that little twist on it, I was not aware of. So thanks for mentioning it. Sure. Um, you you know there was an article you, I had not known about this, and thanks to your article, I, you wrote this. I want to say uh, about three or four years ago, regarding Saudi Arabia citing FBI's Nice Commission in asking a judge to toss the lawsuit against them. Uh, could you speak more about that issue? Well, all I know is that they, they sought to use the conclusions and they've, they've done this for the, with the 9-11 commission as well. Right, right. They, they, you know, they're saying, hey, look, there've been these official investigations here. Uh, they've all cleared us, ergo, we didn't do anything. Uh, and, uh, the, you know, uh, that simply is not the case. I mean, you can talk to the individual members of the 9-11 Commission, for instance, and uh, they will tell you that they were not cleared, uh, that there were certain statements that were made, but those statements do not clear them. They simply say that we have no evidence. Right, and just to, uh, for, my, for my listeners, um, Ed Meese is the Attorney General who was authorized by Congress to conduct an external review of the FBI's post 9-11 performance. Um, and the April 2002 report, which was released to you by the FBI in the 2013 FOIA, um, according, the FBI told the Mies Commission in 2002 that the report was poorly written and wholly unsubstantiated. Um, and I think there was this, and we, we're both going to agree, is that the FBI, even today, continues to basically cover up Saudi complicity regarding the September 11, 2001 terrorist attacks. And I think it's basically because it's in the State Department's best interest to do so because of the enormous um, decades-long relationship with the Saudi lobby. Well, that certainly appears to be the case. I mean, is it, uh, is it definitively proven? No. Uh, but it's, you know, all, all signs point in that direction. Right, because I, I can't see, I, I mean, this is something I've, I've tried for a couple of years now to try and understand why there is such a stonewall. I mean, I, I recently just interviewed Ken Williams, um, the author of the Phoenix Memo, a former agent 25 years in Phoenix, in regards to um, the FBI asking him to not help with the victims' families, the 9-11 victims' families, 
in their lawsuit against the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. And he basically went against that and did testify on their behalf. Um, it just, uh, and he says that the reason why he was, he said he was in shock that the FBI would ask him to do that. I know, and he's not the only one. I mean, the, the, there's a number of different former FBI agents that are now, you know, working for the attorneys uh, for the families here, trying to dig out uh, information. And um, one is a woman named Catherine Hunt, uh, who had been a counterterrorism uh, agent here in the United States and also overseas in Iraq. Uh, and she started looking into some of the information about, you know, that was out there about Operation Encore. She used that October 2012 report that I mentioned before. Uh, and uh, she dug up some new conclusions, new information, new names uh, that actually I ended up putting in a story just about a week, 10 days ago uh, about all this. In, you know, just to, I, I'd love to ask you about your, uh, if you're aware, um, in the days after September 11, 2001 terrorist attacks, there were reports by CNN, MSNBC that talked about uh, extra airliners that were um, that had found weapons, uh, knives taped to the, or box cutters taped to the back of food trays, um, making 9/11 even potentially even a bigger operation. Now Bob Graham, who we spoke about just previously, even stated. Uh, to the Real News Network, to uh, Paul uh, J. Uh, Paul J. Um, in 2012, that he even acknowledged that 9/11 was supposed to be even a bigger operation than just four planes. I've reported on this, and I did a, a separate podcast about uh, one plane called United Airlines Flight 23, where there was three Arab men. Uh, the plane never took off because they were called back to the gate. Three Arab men got into an argument, and then when they left. Uh, security officials found their luggage and behind it there was box cutters and Al-Qaeda manual. One had a license from Florida, a flight training license. Um, in the days afterwards, CNN, MSNBC started doing reports about other planes finding weapons about this. Um, was this something that was known to you at the time? I, 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 yeah, I, not at the time, uh, but uh, certainly when I started looking into this, I heard about, um, I'd only heard of one example uh, uh, the one you mentioned about the three Arabs that were taken off a plane, mm. uh, but they never, you know, th there's nothing solid about it. There's no, uh, as far as I know, there's no information with, with the names of the people that were involved, uh, you know, anything that's concrete there. So is it, is there, is there something to that or not? I don't know. And I don't know if it's been thoroughly investigated. My suspicion is it has not been. Yeah, the, I, I've actually filed a, a freedom of information request regarding the flight masters for Flight 23, and I was told that I needed a warrant, and I think that was the right answer because I'm just an independent investigator myself. Um, but I found it to be highly interesting because if that was the case, uh, that would basically follow the original thoughts of Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, who is the alleged 9-11 mastermind who's currently in Guantanamo where he brings up the idea, uh, if we're to believe what he has said, um, and this is backed up by Ramsey bin al Sheep, but also um, a, a financial courier and uh, mastermind of 9-11 itself, both at Guantanamo, where they both said, and even to an interview to Yoshi Fudo of Al Jazeera in 2002, where they said that the original plan was to involve 10 planes. And he brought that idea to bin Laden, and bin Laden basically said, it would involve too many people, and he said uh, they'll think about it. And then there was a second meeting involving Khalid Sheikh Mohammed and Bin Laden, and they agreed on on four four planes. And uh, right, well, it's certainly not out of the question if there could have been a, at least a, one additional plane. Right. But uh, you know, I mean, this was a it was a, a pretty uh, uh, extraordinary undertaking uh, in terms of uh, the logistics of it. Sure. And, each plane you add uh, adds uh, a, a huge complication factor. So I don't know. All I know is that uh, there was enough destruction from the ones that we had, but you would think, you would hope that the FBI checked out 
these other claims that there were other claims involved. But uh, I, again, I haven't seen anything particularly written about this that would discuss all this. And um, from my vantage point here, you have to remember, I'm a I'm a local reporter, right. uh, uh, and, um, and and Florida Bulldog is a small operation. I am the only actual employee. I've got five or six other uh, uh, um, you know veteran freelancers that I work with. But uh, we don't have the ability to do the kinds of investigation uh, into this uh, matter. I mean, it's already become a lot broader than I had originally thought it would be. I thought it would just focus on Florida. And then all of a sudden, we're involved in looking at what happened in Southern California and, uh, and, and other places around the country. Yeah, I'm just, I, you know, let me touch on that for two. I mean, for such a small group of people you guys are, you report on such important topics. And, you, and it's unfortunate because these are the topics you would think that the legacy media would be salivating on, especially the Sarasota incident, just to use that as an example. And there's so many stories that you report on that I, I'm, I'm like aghast at how there's almost like this willful ignorance or total dismissal uh, regarding anything relating to Saudis, their involvement, um, and to the State Department or to the Department of Justice. Uh, and you're like a, a small group of people, dedicated uh, investigative reporters. Here you are against this monolith of, of uh, disinformation that's, or, or just abject refusal to report on the facts by the legacy media. Well, the, there's two things that have struck me about all this. One is when Khashoggi was butchered, um, and that story deservedly got a lot of attention. Um, but, uh, you know, it was kind of like, well, wait a minute, that was one person. What about the thousands of people mm. that died in 9-11? Um, why aren't you coming back to that? And there's scant attention paid. And especially in New York, um, I mean, first of all, in Washington and New York, this is a local story in both places because this is where this happened. But in New York, even more so uh, because um, there's active litigation uh, up there. There's, uh, you know, I mean, this is what you do when you're a newspaper. You cover big cases. This is a big case. The New York Times isn't really covering it. And I don't understand that. Have you been pressured by the FBI to, to, no. to uh, no. no, 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 no. The FBI does their best to ignore us. Is, it, is that because of the fact that you're such a small group of people and they don't think that you'll be able to be a threat to them? I don't know. Who knows? I mean, they don't, they don't communicate with us, but uh, I will right. say, I will say this, that um, the, um, the other day, um, you know, we were represented in this litigation uh, pro bono by a couple of different law firms. Um, uh, and um, their names are Hunton, Andrews and Kurth and Gunster. Gunster oh. is where Tom Julin works. And Tom Julin has been our, he's been the, the, the principal uh, attorney for us. He's a first amendment guy, uh, a super lawyer. And um, the, um, the, the government, you know, they had made a claim um, for a lot more than they got. But the point is the government settled that, paid $50,000, and these two law firms donated it to Florida Bulldog to allow us to, oh. you know, continue. So I think they should get some credit for that. They didn't have to do that, and they did. Well, that's a I think that's fantastic. Uh, I, I just thought of something in my head, too. I, I had not known this. Um, you reported that... Um, there were uh, that lawyers told a federal judge uh, regarding that Saudi agents were intimidating 9-11 witnesses abroad. That's what that's what the uh, lawyers up in uh, New York. New York, right. Yeah, right. So, um, yeah, I did not. Could you talk about that a little bit? I, well, I don't know the details of it. All I know is this was the assertion that was made in some of the court documents filed by the attorneys. They didn't provide details. You got to remember. Um, the um, there's an FBI gag order in effect up there 
So there's a, a lot of information doesn't ever get out. Um, for instance, they just got finished uh, um, deposing um, a variety of different uh, Saudi uh, officials. None of those depositions are matters of public record. Right. And um, will they ever come out? I don't know. Um, but what's a, what's I, I will tell you this is my understanding that the way this case is unfolding now is that sometimes towards the end of this year or early next year, uh, the Saudis will once again move uh, to have the case dismissed, uh, contending that they the, you know, the the plaintiffs in this thing haven't made the connection, um, and then the judge will have to decide whether or not he's going to toss this case, which will obviously cause an appeal, or whether he will allow it to continue. And if he does allow it to continue, um, it's again my understanding, and I'm not an attorney, but as I've talked to some of the attorneys involved in this, uh, that they would then be able to expand uh, the area of discovery to look at other areas where there was activity by the hijackers, including Florida, Arizona, New Jersey, Virginia, places like that. You know, just to touch on that just a little bit, uh, the 28 pages, which were the pages from the Joint House Inquiry Final Report that alleges Saudi financing to some of the night love suspects, do you believe that that's just tip of the iceberg? Do you think that there were more classified documents that could show a more broader conspiracy involving more players involved? Or do you think otherwise? We, I mean, there's no way to know, but yes, I suspicion. I mean, yeah, why yeah. are they going to the, why are, you know, I mean, they, they've been trying very hard to keep a lid on this. Uh, and, um, but they're going up against some very savvy lawyers. I mean, it's not just one law firm. There's a yeah. bunch of law firms, a bunch of very smart lawyers involved in this whole thing. Uh, and, uh, you know, why is the government, why is the United States government sitting, when they go to court, this is one of the things that bothers the, the, the family members when they go to court, they'll see the U.S. representatives sitting on the same side with the Saudis. Uh, yes. um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, I would imagine you'd feel the same way. You'd be pretty upset about that if it was you. I think it's demoralizing. To say. It's also self-defeating. Um, but Dan, what are your future endeavors regarding 9-11? Um, are there any more documents you're going to try and pressure the State Department or the FBI about declassifying in the future? Uh, yeah, as a matter of fact, I'm working on a FOIA request as we speak. Um, and um, But um, most of our reporting is going to be uh, confined to seeing if we can develop further things uh, that happened here. We do have some additional leads on stuff. Uh, that we haven't been able to pin down, but we're, you know, we're going to keep trying. Sure. And certainly we're going to be covering what happens up in New York. Um, what's interesting there is stuff, for, you know, every now and then begins to be little bits and pieces become unsealed and they appear on the docket. And when they do, if I spot them, um, I'll report on them. Sure, absolutely. Um, and in regards to... Um... The 9-11 truth movement in general, and it seems, you know, this is something we talked about before our recording session, in that um, what I think is uh, troublesome, to say the least, is that there are certain organizations, one of them being a, an actual a law, a, a committee of lawyers called the Lawyers Committee for 9-11 Inquiry, um, which is headed by Dave Mieswinkel, Barbara Honiger. And if you don't know those names, uh, Barbara Honiger, who, who once served under the Reagan administration, um, who purports that Flight 77 did not crash into the Pentagon. And Dave Mieswick, who was one of the co-founders of the Lawyers Committee, um, you know, shockingly doesn't believe a plane crashed into the Pentagon in Shanksville. And these are lawyers. Um, and, un you know, they, they just actually got a um, their citizens' rights denied by the Southern District of New York, which was filed with eight co-plaintiffs uh, involved with the 9-11 victims' families. I, what, I mean, could you basically give your uh, some advice to these uh, fringe conspiracy movements about whether they're hurting actual law firms like Motley Rice and Creedler 
in their case against Saudi Arabia by purporting these outrageous scenarios? Well, <laughs> I don't know if that would do any good. Uh, right, yeah. We have, it, it's not just on this. I mean, look at the, you know, what's happening out in the country with, uh, with the virus and vaccinations and oh. things. People are, you know, there's just a lot of people that don't believe anything uh, that has any, in any way, any connection back to the government here. Um, all this seems to trace back years ago to me. It seemed to begin with the Warren Commission and then you, right. you know, had Watergate and then you had, uh, you know, the uh, Iran Contra and, you know, all these various episodes where things happen. And I just, you know, and then uh, and God knows there were lots of other ones that I've left out, but, um, you know, there's been an erosion of trust there. Um, and it's sad because it's it, it, in this particular case, uh, well, in, in both cases, I mean, I'm, I'm not certainly not an expert on the vaccines, but um, um, it seems pretty clear that uh, you should be getting vaccinated out there. Mm -hmm. And it also seems pretty clear because we saw it with our own eyes that planes hit these buildings. Um, and, um, you know, I mean, with the with the Pentagon, I mean, tell that to uh, uh, tell that to uh, the, the husband of um, who's that woman who was on flight 77 who died. Her husband was the solicitor general of the United States. Bob, um, Barbara Olson. Barbara. Yes, Barbara Olson and her husband, um, you know, tell him that uh, it was a missile strike and not the plane. Then where is Barbara today? OK. Where are all the other people that were on that plane? Where's Where's uh, Al Hazmi and Al Midhar? Well, they're disintegrated when the plane hit the Pentagon. That's what. So you know, it seems to me that they're wasting people's time and effort, and they ought to look where the actual evidence is, not some fantasy. Dan Christensen, former investigative reporter for the Miami Herald and Daily Business Review, and the founder of Florida Bulldog. Thank you very much for coming on. All right. Thanks for having me.